Time to take a look at German squad tactics in World War II. Two important points. First, a squad rarely acted alone on the battlefield and was used in coordination with other squads of its platoon and or company. Second, the main source for this is the US manual German squad in combat from the Military Intelligence Service. It is a partial translation of a German manual and with using other sources I could detect some small errors and inconsistencies nevertheless take everything with a grain of salt, especially since manuals and combat realities often differ. Let's begin with the organization and armament. The German infantry squad in World War II for the most part consists of one squad leader and nine infantrymen, thus a total of 10 men. Initially, all men besides the machine gun and his assistants were equipped with the Karabiner 98 Kurz, the German standard rifle in World War II. Even the squad leader was equipped with that rifle. Yet around 1941 he was issued an MP40 submachine gun, with six magazines, 32 shots each. The machine gunner was equipped with a MG34 and later on with a MG42. He was also issued a pistol and an ammo drum with 50 rounds. The assistant gunner carried four ammo drums with 50 shots each. Additionally, one ammo box with 300 rounds. He was also issued a pistol. There was also an ammo carrier assigned to the machine gunner, whose job was to carry and supply ammunition. He carried two ammo boxes with 300 rounds each. Unlike the assistant, he was issued a rifle, not a pistol. Note that the German squad in combat indicates a pistol instead of a rifle as a weapon for the ammo carrier. But it seems this is incorrect and is probably from an old layout of the squad, which was used in 1937. Now each rifleman had around 9 clips for his rifle with 5 shots each, thus 45 rounds. This was the regular amount. According to Buchner, more rounds were issued in case of a combat situation. Also, the second in command was armed the same way as the regular rifleman. Hence, in total, the squad had one light machine gun, one submachine gun, two pistols, seven rifles and several hand grenades, which were issued depending on the situation. Now the roles and responsibilities of each squad member were as follows. The squad leader was commanding the unit. He directed which targets the LMG should engage and if the combat situation permitted, also the rifle fire. His responsibilities outside of the combat included that the equipment of the unit was in order and that enough ammunition was available. The second in command was his assistant and was in command during the absence of the squad leader. His responsibilities were to communicate with the platoon command and also adjacent squads, thus he was vital for the coordination. Next is the machine gunner. He operated the light machine gun and was responsible for taking care of the weapon. His assistant would help him setting up the MG, supply ammo and assist him in combat. Usually he would be positioned left of the gunner or to his rear. He had to be ready and close enough to support the gunner with tasks like changing the bow or fixing jams. And in case the gunner couldn't continue operating the MG, he would take his role. The ammo carrier was responsible for inspecting the ammo, refilling fired ammo belts and checking for left ammunition. He usually stayed in the rear and in cover, but could act as a rifleman if necessary. The regular rifleman's duty was to participate in combat with his rifle and bayonet. The rifleman formed the assault part of the squad, thus if necessary assaulting the enemy position with grenades and bayonets. Although not officially designated, they would also serve as ammo carriers to varying degrees. Now let's take a look at formations. The basic close order formations were the squad line or Reihe, the squad column or Kette, which was basically a 90 degree turn of the previous and of course the squad in march order. As you can see, the machine gunner with his assistance is always at the very front. He was the key member of the squad, which is also indicated by his designation Schütze 1, infantryman number 1. These were close order formations that were not suited for dangerous situations. Close order formations were abandoned if the situation changed due to terrain, hostile activity or other circumstances. The basic extended order formations were the squad column or Schützenkette and the skirmish line or Schützenreihe. The squad column in extended order was not a straight line, instead the soldiers used terrain for cover. Although the principal order of the line remained, note that the second in command was at the end. 
ensuring that the squad stayed together. The skirmish line was used if the firepower of the whole squad was necessary. In this case the rifleman moved to the left and right of the machine gunner, who remained at the central position. The forward half of the infantryman moved to the right and the other half to the left. Alternatively an echelon right or left deployment was also possible. In this case all the men moved to the right or left of the machine gunner. The distance between the men was about 3.5 meters. Yet this was only a guideline. Note that the squad leader had no fixed position in this formation. In terms of leadership, the translated manual states that leading by example is essential. It is explicitly stated. In order to be a leader in the field, a superior must display an exemplary bearing before his men in the moment of danger and be willing, if necessary, to die for them. The weak and facilitating are then guided by his example and by his disregard of self in accepted privations and dangers. Now let's take a look at the squad in offensive actions. It is very important to note that the squad in offensive combat would not act alone, but as an element of its platoon. Note that each platoon contained usually four squads. So let's look at the different stages of offensive combat. The stages are as follows. Development, deployment, advancing, attack and penetration. Note that most other sources use less stages and the transition from one stage to another can be quite fluent or blurry. The development phase is the first step in the preparation of an attack. The rifle company left the marching route and broke up into three platoons. Those platoons themselves separated into four squads, yet the squads remained in close formation. The machine gun and other important equipment was now carried by hand and not on carts anymore. Next was the deployment phase which was about organizing the troops into combat formations. The squad leader may have received his orders directly from the platoon leader or acted independently based on the mission of the platoon. Since the units were now in battle formation, the advance phase began. The advance was ideally performed in squad column with the light machine gun on the front. This would allow rearward supporting machine guns and other weapons to fire safely past the advancing squads. If the squad was under effective enemy fire, the squad needed to use its own fire to support its movement by achieving temporarily fire superiority. Fire and movement should be employed, which means that one part of the squad fires to cover the movement of the other part of the squad. This principle can also be used on a larger scale where one squad covers another squad. If areas were covered by enemy artillery fire, they would have been avoided if possible. If not, these areas needed to be crossed during firing pauses and quick rushes. Generally it was recommended to use rushes when the situation and enemy fire did permit them. Following a successful advance of the squads far enough, the attack phase commenced. Although the difference is not so obvious at first, since both stages include firing upon the enemy and also advancing. Yet during the advance phase, firing is only employed if it is necessary, whereas in the attack phase, Firing was usually a crucial element. Initially, the firefight was started by heavy weapons from supporting units like artillery, infantry cannons and heavy machine guns. These weapons focused on the destruction or neutralization of strong points. Yet it is noted, it is not the task of the rifleman to engage in firefights of long duration in order to gain fire superiority. In the attack, in the final analysis, it is the vigorous shock power of the rifleman with bayonet which overcomes the enemy. Hence at this point the squad still advanced. Generally the squad should move as much forward without firing as possible. Only if this wasn't possible anymore it should engage the enemy. The final stage is the penetration into the enemy positions. It is usually initiated around 100 meters away from the enemy positions. In penetration, the whole group rushes or fires as a unit. If possible, the platoon leader employs several squads advancing from various directions against the objective. In this way, the defensive fires of the enemy will be scattered. This form of attack is no longer carried out by the squad, but by the platoon. It is important that the maximum amount of fire is provided during an assault. For this reason, 
the LMG should be positioned to fire into the enemy position without risking friendly fire. If such a position is not attainable, the LMG should be used directly in the assault and fired from the hip. Furthermore, neighboring units should provide additional firepower and or support the assault by a complementary attack from another direction. Once the riflemen closed in on the enemy position, the designated granite throwers on command would use their granites and after the detonation the squad stormed the positions under the lead of the squad leader. To give you a better idea how two squads with supporting elements would assault an enemy position, here's a little illustration. Based on an original German manual from what I can tell, but the document I got it from provided no direct reference. Here you can see the German position on the left side and the fictional enemy on the right. Both positions were reinforced by barbed wire. There's a German mortar pit with a light mortar and in the visible rear positions another light and heavy mortar are available. The mortars would attack the following areas of the enemy positions to prevent reinforcements. To support the attack two heavy machine guns would be positioned on the flanks. In the center a squad with a light machine gun would fire at the enemy positions to support the attack. The assault itself would be performed by two assault squads that were supported by light machine guns. The first squad would directly assault the enemy position, whereas the second one would attack the rear and cut it off from any reinforcements. Once the assault was successful, the squad leader would ensure discipline and prepare against a potential counterattack. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, share, and subscribe. And see you next time.